you're an alternative to a patriarchal world, a world organized around certainty, around speed, a world organized that no matter what your kids are, they're not enough. It amazes me that the high, so-called high-achieving children are more prone to suicide than the rest. Mm -hmm. all, you know, so all of these are systemic large things and we're all living it. And uh, you, to me, are part of the alternative. The alternative is occurring in other places. There's an alternative economics that I'm very involved in. There's an economics of abundance, an economics of happiness. And so there is a subgroup of people. It's not the new economy. The new economy is how to make the old economy better. All right? So all these efforts of economic reform, nothing will change. They're still based on scarcity. So the, the, the market, consumer, ideology, scarcity, which says we don't have enough, and if I don't have enough, I'm not enough. <coughs> so part of what you do in the world is confront systems, people, teachers, children, with the fact that they are enough. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with our children, even our city, but do a lot with the economic things. In the city of Cincinnati, and they say, oh, we have the greatest, the third greatest number of poor children in America. All these cities com compete for their deficiency. <coughs> so when I was traveling a lot, wherever you go in the mid-tier, of course, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, they're perfect. <coughs> Petaluma, perfect. But they compete, so you go to a city and say, we got the worst homicide rate. You know, go to Milwaukee. And you go to Detroit, oh, we got the worst homicide rate. Then go to Cincinnati. We got more people dying. And so the world takes its identity from what it's not, its deficiency. This is the cost of a consumer culture. Uh, you live in a world of social service. If you're in that world, you can't raise a dime based on people's gifts. You can only raise money if you can prove that something's wrong. So Cincinnati just did a study, the Urban League, two cities. So Cincinnati, 65% African American. They did a big study, a lot of publicity, two cities, and everything that's wrong with Cincinnati was documented. Race issues were documented. They make less money, higher unemployment. It's the 14th study of racism in Cincinnati over the last 17 years. And so I've come to believe that when people do a study, they have an incentive to make things bad. That they're getting off on the deficiencies. And it just it drives me crazy. The evening news every has one curriculum every night. And that is to tell us that it's a dangerous world out there. And there's nothing we're going to do about that. In the first 13 minutes, somebody somewhere died or was shot <coughs> or the fire or something. Uh, I'm getting the weather channel now tells me where the hurricanes everywhere in the world. I, I stopped going to work. I just watched the weather channel. <laughs> somewhere, a hurricane something. This building, it's, and it scares the shit out of me. <laughs> can't eat, can't cook. Somewhere in Africa, there's a hurricane. We can get here. So this is the dominant narrative. There's something wrong with us. There's every reason to be afraid. There's better management, better efficiency, better certification, higher standards will help. So. Uh, so you're an alternative to that. Economic people are writing books about happiness. It says we are enough. Uh, most of the, uh, in journalism, there are pockets of journalism called generative journalism, solutions journalism, restorative journalism. And so in every discipline, architecture, there's urban people coming together. There's architects now talking about pocket neighborhoods where people connect with each other. There's a co-housing movement in a long time. There's a cooperative movement. 40 million Americans participate in a co-op one way or the other. And none of this makes the news. Nothing touches the dominant narrative. But what you're doing is beneath the radar of that narrative, you're creating an alternative narrative that says that relationships count. See, in the business perspective, relationships are a cost item. It's designed for impersonality. It's not designed for uniqueness. It's designed for consistency and control and predictability. And so the schools are now run with a business perspective.
So what you're up to is important. Cooperative movement, you're part of it. Uh, and I just love the language that you have. I got introduced by Mike Butler, who's a police chief in Longmont, Colorado, who held community days. He was trying to build community as a police chief. So anybody, police chief, invites me anywhere to talk, I figure something's going on. And something was going on. 2,400 citizens of Longmont have stayed out of the judicial system because of your work. You know, the story of justice, the story of work, the story of facts. So it's amazing what you do. And uh, the problem with what you do, it's so countercultural that it's horribly lonely. <laughs> and you, you think two things, I'm alone, and then after a while you begin to think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason you're here is to discover that you're not alone and you're not crazy. And you're not the only one that's miserable and depressed because of what's happening in the world. <laughs> but I really mean that. Everybody's a pioneer, everybody's discovering something, you always suffer some loneliness. Because it's just such a bombardment. So that's the larger view. Uh, the narrative work is essential. To me, I've come to think that change the conversation, change it, and change the world. That's all it takes. It's all in the beginning was the word. So even God knew that. God started with the word. And so what you're doing is reconstructing, reimagining uh, the narrative that takes place in the institutions that you care about. And it's a, it's a departure from the consumer narrative, not enough narrative. Attributive in your terms, narrative. Uh, and something's going on. I mean, the police chiefs by last week all came together and said, We let these people out of jail. Let my people go. They said, Mass incarceration doesn't. These are police chiefs. They said, It's costing us too much money. Well, it always costs too much money. But anyway, so that got news. I thought that was quite amazing. Canada elected a prime minister. Congratulations. Any of you from Canada, stand up. <laughs> Canada uh, is close to a civil society, as I know. Uh, and then the guy, first day he's elected, three things, I forget what they were. He said, we're going to stop the bombing with the United States. And he had two other things that just blew me away. We're going to stop polarizing each other and picking so I think that's, and then the third thing is this guy comes to Philadelphia and New York, Pope Francis. I mean, it's quite amazing. I was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike before he came and it said, Pope coming to Philadelphia next week, take alternate route. <laughs> This guy who's gay traveled with his partner. And the Pope says, Who am I to judge? And I thought, Holy, holy. <laughs> the, Pope, the Pope doesn't judge. You know, that, that's all off the hook. That's all he did. He was the final authority. So if something's going on, so you have these little blips. And so I thought we'd spend this time saying, Well, if the if the task is to shift the narrative, yes, all transformation is linguistic, and I believe that it is. I know that my transformation is dependent on my shifting the story I have about myself. And I love the idea that in Russia, even the past is unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> In Russia, even the past is unpredictable. And I figure if that's true about Russia, which my family came from a while ago, then it's true about me. So I have a story. Okay, I did have a mother and a father and a sister and a brother. But everything else I made up. And so I have my story. I've held it for a long time. Sister this, mother that, father died. Uh, well, and once you realize it's all fiction, then it changes it. Now, we, now everybody wants to hear their story, stories all the way down. But I always know I'm happy to hear your story, but I want to know if you told it more than three times. Mm -hmm. And if you told it more than three times, then it's 
a defense against the future. Mm. Right? So people's story is their meaning making of the world, and that's a limitation to anything changing. So you might say, I mean, we're in this world to keep reconstructing our story. So I want to hear it, but I know when I hear your story that you made it up. So I would really ask you, what's the fiction that you're living into? What's the excuse? So the story becomes an excuse. We have this belief that my past determines me. So the social sciences are based partly on the notion that I can be explained. Is somebody's phone? Yeah. That's your conscience calling. <laughs> I don't mind it, but I'd like to answer. <laughs> I did that once. Somebody said, you want to answer? What the hell are you doing bothering this person? <laughs> don't you know that I'm not I'm not interested in your surgery. <laughs> so that's the narrative then becomes the act of reconstruction. So a friend of mine, Walter Brueggemann, He uses the Exodus narrative story. And he said, we're living in Pharaoh's Egypt now. So we're living in a world that values commerce above all else. And commerce even between us. And he said the problem with the Jews was not that they were slaves, they just couldn't imagine not being slaves. And I thought that, wow, what a thought. So our work then is to help people come to terms with one that their story about how they got here is totally constructive. It's a social construction. And it doesn't explain me that I can't use my past as cause and me as effect. So the conversations that I want to engage in with the conversations of agents, because most people's story hold themselves as object, hold themselves as effect. Oh, this explains me. This is why I am this way. And then people get stuck and trapped in that story because they think it actually explains something. So the first thought about conversations is you want to only have people talk about conversations that reinforces their sense of agency or ownership, that they are in control of their life. And if you can help them shift their story, or see the cost of their current story, whether it's an individual, a school, an urban school, I work a lot in, in uh, distressed neighborhoods. Uh, <coughs> poor people, there's no such thing as a poor person. No person is defined by their income level. That's not who I am. A lot of you I know grew up broke, as I did, but I never called myself poor. So I've stopped calling people poor. Poor children, no such thing. Most children don't have any money. Poor child. And it activates all kinds of stuff and all kinds of deficiencies. We have this belief that if you don't go to school, you don't have a chance, which is really interesting. We've got all these graduates now that are pissed off. <laughs> so they spend a lot of money and there's nothing out there. It's not that student debt's too high, it's just that they've got no way to pay it off. So the whole school story is if you don't go to school, we want to send kids to school in Cincinnati earlier, black kids, we've got them get third grade, the three-year-old, four-year-old, two-year-old, pretty soon we'll be going into the womb. <laughs> Technology will reach a point where we can just things. Yikes. And, uh, and so all of these are constructions, stories. There's some truth to it. Of course, if you've got kids, you'd rather go to school than not. But the notion that you don't have a chance if you don't have, it's an illusion. It's a, and so every powerful story powerful construction is a narrative in which people are accountable for their own being. So whenever people complain to me about their boss or the administrator, the principal, or the agency, I know that's a story that's letting them off the hook. So I never believe it. I may not say anything. I don't go around people and confronting them with their stories. <laughs> but I know in my mind their story has no power. Anytime people tell me a story about what those people are doing, they're waiting then for someone else's transformation. Now, I don't like what those people are doing. I'm not saying they're not evil in the world, or assholes in the world, technical term. <laughs> <laughs> but to talk about it, it's 
something that we have to do something about. It reinforces the helplessness. So what these conversations do, what you do in the world, is confront people with their helplessness. And even with the justice from the offender, victim, you're confronting both sides are players in this. Both sides are wounded in this. I mean, there's such compassion in what you do, who you are. And so that's what I want to take you through, is to say, well, what kind of conversations confront people with their freedom? I just don't believe when people tell me how they were, what happened to them. I, I listen to them because you have to. But the second time, the third time, then I'm colluding. It's not, and I don't confront people, you know. I just invite them into an alternative conversation. And that's what I see you doing. A conversation that's not based on retribution. That's not based on not enough. That's not based on an explanation of how they got here. I'm not interested in how they got here. I'm interested in the fact they're here. I run and help start a hip hop center in Cincinnati. Because it must be obvious that you know the big hip hop guy. <laughs> <laughs> My hips are sore and I can't hop. So <laughs> we decided, somebody else decided, and I just joined it. So well, why don't we take these urban kids and find out what they love to do, and find out what they're good at. And it turns out hip hop culture is a nice window into that. And so they come in, they learn to make records, engineer. They learn with feed arts, they learn to DJ, they learn to do dance. And when they walk in the door, we ask them you know, just two questions. One is, what do you love to do? I'm not interested in your history. I don't care how many years of school you have. I don't care whether you've been in jail or not. And the second is, is there any adults in your life that have your well-being at, at heart? And most of them, the answer is, well, adults is zero or one. And I know if we can get that number to four or five, they will stay out of trouble. But the reason they're in trouble is something to do with the fact that adult people. And so that's the work. The work is to help people, and that's what you do for people. It's up to them over to come to their loneliness, their isolation. It's up to me, and you help them come up with a story that has some imagination. And I was broke, but I always thought it would get better. I thought if I was a good, you know, I wasn't exactly right about this, but I thought if I was a good boy, you know, and acted interested in class, that's basically what I did. I knew how to make eye contact, I knew how to lean forward, and act interested. I didn't run shit. <laughs> I didn't care what I learned. I wanted the easier. I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted a high school degree. I was scared. I threatened kids, you know. You don't make it to seventh grade, yeah, eighth grade, college. I, I applied to one school that had to take me. Okay, University of Kansas. You were a C student in 1961. They had to take you. So I applied, I think, in May of the year I went to. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else was too frightening. Too overwhelming. And I, I kept, so I, that's the that story, okay? Uh, the people you're dealing with, you say, okay, well, and the kids like kids in Cincinnati, the reason they kill each other, one of the reasons, is they, they think by the time they're 24 years old, they're going to be dead or in jail. So they're living into that story. So if I'm going to be dead or in jail, it's the point. It's the point. And so I, I want to give you the, a methodology for shifting the narrative create an alternative conversation. And uh, all of these questions are selected because if you answer them, at the moment that you answer them, you develop agents. To answer these questions, even to say, I won't answer this question, you're now acting as if you're accountable and responsibility for yourself and the world around you. And to me, this is, the, this is what community does. You're very community-minded. You're very relational-minded, and you are for practical reasons. It's not just for loneliness. This is that I, if I get four or five people in my social circle, my health gets better. All right? My kids are connected in a class. The circle means my, I learn faster. It means I make more money. All the things we care about, making a living, being healthy, raising a child, taking care of the elderly. See, in a consumer world, we want to warehouse. We want to extract them. So the problem is in Cincinnati, if we work, live in one of these eight neighborhoods of, of uh, we don't have any money, is go to school and you can escape your neighborhood. 
We extract him like we extract minerals from Africa. And so our work is to say, why don't we build the economic and relational vitality of a place, a neighborhood, instead of being mobile, we'll get you out of there. And so all of these conversations that are help people get connected. And I know if they get connected and act as if they're in creating their lives, instead of being effect, if they're being caused, that something good's going to happen. And that's what you do. So I want to uh, go through this with you and give you the methodology. These are protocols. See, the business protocol is Robert's Rules of Order. That's why being on a board is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> it fills the expectation of its title. <laughs> in the board room, I know what I'm going to experience. I know by the architecture, it's a long, narrow table, which means that we have to take sides against each other. Even the way we're going to reconfigure this room in a moment, because right now we're totally living out the patriarchy. I'm talking, I'm standing, you're sitting, listening, you're acting interested. <laughs> <laughs> but this configuration says that I'm the only one whose voice matters and that you all turned your backs on each other. Mm -hmm. Every auditorium, every church, okay, says by its physical design that we came here to learn docility. I came here to be passive. I came here knowing that people next to me have nothing important to say to me. I go in the church, it's very welcoming. I've never been in a church that wasn't happy to see me. Right? But then as soon as I walk in, I'm right back in my isolation. I sit there and wait for the professional to decide to go to work. People up front. And I always think, why does God need so much help? <laughs> you, know, you go to a temple or a mosque or a church, you get closer to God, and then of course, <clears throat> Given what we see, we all sit in the back. <laughs> but I want to get out of here soon. <laughs> so that becomes the work. This, the room counts. The way people sit. So you're always reconstructing how the dominant narrative, patriarchal world, has designed our experience to give us the feeling of being effect, being you know, not being agents, all right. And so that's the, that's the thought. So there's six conversations that have occurred to me. You all have your own six, all right. One is a conversation of possibility. So most of the world wants to talk about problems. Write like this up here. Uh, most of us feel there's no problem. What use are we? And so the alternative says, what's the possibility that you are? What's the possibility that comes into the room when you show up? It's not a goal. It's not an objective. It's not a plan. God laughs at all of Another uh, conversation is one of ownership. Suppose, for all the things I complain about, I chose to talk about how I'm creating those things. So let's say, you know, like in Donald Trump, is, is it doesn't get any better than Donald. <laughs> I don't care where you live in the world. <laughs> you came a long way. You did not come here to hear about Donald. <laughs> I can complain about him or love him. It doesn't matter. The only question that matters is what's my contribution to having created a world where he's so possible. So the question, what's your contribution to what's going on here? But you know all about big shit. Most of the world wants to blame or people accountable. The dominant narrative says, whose fault is it? We don't care what suffering there is. We want to know who caused it. That's the retributive world. I don't care what happened. I want to know who caused it. Why do you want to know who caused it? Well, we want to prevent it from happening again. <laughs> <laughs> makes it happen. Retribution produces crime. Produces violence. Our attempts at healing, they're all iatrogenic, like you always said. All of our attempts at reform is what's creating the need for reform. It's not reform. So that's another conversation of dissent. If you can't say no, your yes means no. 
in high control institutions. We give emphasis to loyalty. We want you to be a team player. Mm -hmm. I want you to be a can-do kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So no terrifies us, consider disloyal. So part of your work in the world is to help people say no. No is the beginning of a conversation of commitment. It's the beginning of a conversation. Of a conversation of commitment. So the consumer world believes in barter. What's in it for me? A quid pro quo. Incentive. Let's pay these parents to come to back to school. We think we can purchase love, purchase everything. And so commitment is to say yes or make a promise with no expectation of return. And make the promise for its own sake. Now the economist doesn't like this. Adam Smith didn't like this. He didn't think the butcher would cut our meat unless there was an economic incentive for the butcher to cut our meat. This is the and then there's, there's a conversation of gifts. So most of us know about what's wrong with us. I've known what's wrong with me. Uh, if I ever got into another relationship, which I won't, because this one's going to last, but if I ever did, I could write the manual for the feedback. So I've gotten pretty much the same feedback from every relationship with a woman I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and I've been working on it really hard for about 55 years <laughs> with no uh, evidence of success. <laughs> I listen a little more, I interrupt a little less, I make eye contact about the same amount. <laughs> I kind of think that my opinions are a little more interesting than the opinions of those around me, so interrupting people, small price to pay. <laughs> I, period. Okay, I want to, I want to. So well, these are little habits of mine. I can explain where they came from. <laughs> so focusing on deficiencies strengthens. Them. What you see is what you get. And so there's an incentive. So the Urban League published this two cities report on racism. Why? It creates demand for the Urban League. All right, so deficiency studies are a celebration of the people doing the study, the people funding the study. So the whole big conversation is gifts, how you confront people with their blessings, with their grace, with their gifts. People say, well, let's, what do we do wrong this time so we can do better next time? Well, there is no next time. There's not going to be a next time. Even if the same people are gathered, they'll be wearing different outfits. We know that's decisive. So the whole idea of let's figure out what we're doing wrong here so we can improve is a way of keeping things doing wrong. Because there's no next time. Uh, every, every gathering that evaluates it at the end is to help us and fuel that. It's too late to do anything about it. We care about how this conference is going. We've got to ask you how it's going every step of the way. Uh, and so the gift-mindedness is a huge conversation. And uh, I'll talk more about it later, but uh, the only time we really talk about gifts is when somebody's dead. I know when I die, there will be some occasion, gathering, and there will be a eulogy, and people will forgive me, all right? Little <laughs> habits that I got worse <laughs> But it's going to be too late. I'm not going to hear it. I'll be dead. And that's the only time we value gifts is when somebody's done. It. So our work is to bring the gift conversation into every step, every time we get, every time we're together. We keep deepening people's understanding of what they're good at. This is not a warm fuzzy. This is not a path to love or relate. You do it because I need to know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. These kids you deal with, whatever you they know they've been told all their life. People can make a living off of their deficiency. Talbot House is the biggest social service agency in Cincinnati. Their budget keeps growing. You know, they keep opening more local groups. And I think, isn't that a sign of failure? If they are not doing the drug we have, if they're dealing with the people that aren't making it and their business is growing, isn't that a problem? And so all of that's a deficiency mindset. And, uh, 
So those are the conversations. And then the one is the invitation. You know, the people in the room who chose to be there. And uh, my own belief is that, and then you'll have your own questions, but all I give you is the experience together. And a set of questions that if people answer them, or don't answer them, but when the question is brought into the world, all right, uh, choice has a chance. Accountability has a chance. Intimacy has a chance. The business perspective is terrified of this. It's called lost production. <laughs> and the cell phone world, the technology, reinforces my alienation. Sold as a connecting device. And it's, it's quite amazing, but I don't want to get into it. You know, so that's what this is what a frame. And this is what is going on in everybody who's trying to rebuild. So what I've just done is give you context, okay? Trying to give you a reason. I can't just break you into small groups as you come in the room. But I need a context wherever I go. What's the point? Uh, and the context is a shift in there to change a conversation from helplessness to agency, helplessness to citizen. So I say to people, how do you want to be? I'm a citizen of Cincinnati, that's what I do. Uh, all the rest is just story. And then this helps people create space and enough love intimacy connection so they can imagine leaving Egypt. They can imagine not being a slave. And that's what was so hard. Especially when you told the Jews, oh, where we have where are we going? You're going to the wilderness. Well you know what the wilderness is? It's a place with no visible means of support. How's that for a sales pitch? <laughs> I'm waiting for a candidate that says, I'm not going to raise your children. I'm not going to get them to school. I'm not going to find you a job. Yeah. So that's the work. To, to create space and enough connection so people can imagine an alternative. And, uh, and get over this notion that there's something wrong with me, that my story explains what got me here that those people need to change. How are we going to tell truth to power? That's a joke to me. Who claims truth? If all my stories are fiction, what does it mean that somebody claims I'm telling the truth? I have the truth. No, you don't have the truth. You just have a compelling story. Tell it. Go for it. Shout it. Scream it. Scream it together. It's fine. You know, and, and things need to be protested. But underneath that, Ultimately, we have to decide we're going to create together an alternative to the world that I've inherited. And to me, that's the, the story. And what you're restoring is connectedness. You're restoring uh, relationship intimacy. You're restoring power to people. They can do something in the world that says what you can't without. You know. Most leadership training teaches managers and leaders to control people more effectively. Skillful leadership is controlling people in a way that they feel good about. It. And so people say, "What well, we need strong leadership and save me from strong." So what I like to do is, uh, any thoughts or questions you have? So I want to give you some uh, plebeian protocols. <laughs> right? So Elijah was the uncredentialed king. So I like that idea. Elijah had the power to heal. All the credentialed kings, all they could do is fight. And so these are protocols of connection, protocols that build intimacy. So let me give you the protocols. First, the small group is the, is the unit of transformation. It's only in the small group that everybody's voice gets heard. And you know this. You invent the circle. The group, in my mind, has to be small enough so there's no place to hide. See, this is not a kind set of protocols. I want to shut the doors. I don't want places to escape. What I'm doing by creating a context that your story you made up is removing an escape hatch. And so the first protocol is you break people into small groups. I like groups of three because three is an unstable number. All right. Two is too small. Because if the other person doesn't want to play, you're screwed. <laughs> so at least with three, you've got twice the chance of being with somebody that wants to engage. And then we can talk numbers. But the first rule is to uh, always seat people with strangers. 
with people they know the least. If you want learning to occur, it can't occur with people that think they know me. And uh, so if you're working with teams and, and agencies, services, churches, uh, you say, I, I want you to break into groups with people that you know the least. Because it's only with a stranger that I can be surprised. See, this culture is terrified of the stranger now. <coughs> That's the argument about immigration with the stranger. And we're terrified of it. We're, 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 we're committed to like-mindedness. We think like-mindedness is a valuable thing. No, it just makes us easier to control. <laughs> and it irritates me. Every time I buy something online, they so here's something people like you also like. <laughs> what irritates me is, is they're so right. <laughs> and so the restorative work is the end of like my entire. Welcome. You haven't missed anything, have you? <laughs> I have invented the content of free presentation. <laughs> so protocol one is the small group. After 20 minutes, there's no use talking. And I, I can do this once you have faith in yourself with 5,000 people, 3,000 people. In the auditoriums, we have two levels. I don't care what God or patriarchy has designed this room for. All right, auditoriums are designed for, for entertainment and persuasion. That's not what you're there for. Not breaking the small one. Well, we can't. We're in the road. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wah, wah, wah. Anytime you put your wines in there, you know, or we don't, I want a table, you know. Uh, where am I going to put my water bottle? Wah, wah, wah. I've had it with that. That's just that's a baby point. I love it. Even the water bottles, half of them have nipples on them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to meetings, for God's sake. I'm not going in the Alps. I'm not worried about losing liquid. <laughs> nipples on them. <laughs> so, whenever you do these things, people will defend against them because they know what you get. And so you just don't take with anybody. I, I tell people, if you can argue with me, be careful, I'm going to take your side. So don't collude with all the reasons not to be in small groups. Oh, well, we came together. We like to be together. I know you like to be together. Now, I, step, I physically will accept this. You know, that's my boss. We get along great. We're excited to be in a small group. I know you. I know if they're with people, they know. They won't learn anything. Now, some people may have worked together for 20 years, that's fine, but there's still some in the group they know the least. So you're acknowledging that, you're making that a big deal. And it brings hospitality into the world. Hospitality is a welcoming of strangers. That's what hospitality is. That's what your job is. That's what you did a beautiful job of welcoming us uh, this morning. Well, you, you came to the group, and so with people you know the least. Second step is don't wait to be chosen. So everybody has a story, okay, that keeps them passive. Everybody's taking a Myers-Briggs question. <laughs> if you haven't taken you've taken some and you've got some initials that describe who you are. And I'm an INFJ. I, I don't remember what they're about, but I am that. <laughs> and so there's a story about being an introvert and blah, blah, blah. I'm not interested in the story of introversion. <laughs> Be with somebody you know the least, get in groups of three, and don't wait to be chosen. All right, so all of these are ownership and protocol. And then the, the most important one is don't be helpful to each other. We have to caution the world against help, especially loving, caring people like us. All right, help is a form of relational colonialism. It says, I know and you don't. Aren't you lucky? How can I help you? Okay? The people you're working with are not your customers. We're citizens. I don't want to be anybody's customer. Maybe I do when I go to Nordstrom's. All right? And so you say, don't give advice. Don't be helpful. Don't tell anybody, well, when I was in your situation, here's what I did. Because that implies that it worked out well. <laughs> 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 
when I was your age, I know. And look at who you are now. <laughs> it didn't go well. <laughs> but it's, it's a form of boasting. Advice is a form of boasting. I can't help it, but I can. And so you, you uh, try to uh, tell people, don't be helpful. Especially if dealing with you, don't be helpful. Don't give advice. Don't tell them what you, don't ask them what you're going to do about it. So you instead find out who this person is. So in your work, in our work, wherever you go, I want to ask people to substitute curiosity for advice. Part of the dominant control, patriarchal world, there's no space for listening. It's all about talking. So that's a big thing going about that, but first you try to replace it by, with curiosity. So when these kids come into elements of what come, we ask them, what do you love to do? Who are you good at? Uh, and we don't give them any advice. Now, if they get there and if they find four people that care about their lives and they realize they're good at singing or dancing or recording or whatever, they stay out of trouble. You know that. You know you're trying to heal the, the symptoms. Getting kids kicked out of school is a symptom of the disconnection. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so that's it. All right. And then sit. Because the chair knees nine inches from here. You have to get people physically close. That's so middle-aged white men can't lean back. <laughs> this, this is the middle-aged white man learning position. <laughs> what are you doing? Just leave me alone. I'm learning. <laughs> Feet out front. You know. So again, the space matters. The physicality matters. The shape. Now anybody can uh, disagree with me. I, don't, I would never facilitate a small group. But in asking people, requesting them to live by these protocols, even if they don't, it's in them. And you're declaring to the world if you want to create whatever your peace that you're trying to create. This is the methodology to do that. So I'd like you to let's do that from now on. We've got, we have to, well, we've got an hour. So I just want to, Go back and forth, give you a question, that you experience it, and then reflect with you on what did you know. Okay, I'll give you a, and all these are kind of social structures. So I'd like you to, the first question is the following. Uh, it honors the fact that people are in the room. See, a lot of people will be in the room, and they didn't know they had a choice. And that's never true. People have an inventory of excuses that are inexhaustible. The dog gave my homework. Some of my favorite ones that he has heard. Of. One is the woman. I said, Why weren't you there? And she, she said, Well, the, my car got stuck in a pond. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I just wanted to talk to her. I didn't get there. Just, you think you could drive it out? <laughs> the best, Margie, the best. I said, Margie, where were you yesterday? She said, Oh, that. My calendar didn't have that day in it. <laughs> I love it. That was ten years ago. That's right. And, uh, Margie, where can I get one of those? Calendars? I know when, they, when the Gregorian Pope Gregory had the meeting. I don't know, standardized how many days in a year, how many hours in a day, 20 minutes an hour. We lost 11 days. <laughs> I want them back. <laughs> Margie got one of those back. <laughs> so, so, so I always going to treat people as if they're in the room by choice, because I know they can get out of it. I don't care if it's court order, they can get out of it. So the first question is, why was it important for you to be here? Don't ask them, how did you get here? Tell me your background. They, think they want to do it, that's fine. It doesn't take us anywhere. Why was it important? So if I can declare through the power of a question uh, what's worth talking about, what's restorative in the language, then I'll always choose that language. <coughs> how did you get here? So it was, oh, somebody recommended it, and somebody left. That's not. Why was it important? For you, so you're substituting questions of procedure, logistics, 
with questions of meaning. So you want to engage people in questions about what does this mean? That's the ultimate curiosity. The best question is to ask people, instead of what are you going to do, you ask them, why does this matter to you? Now that's the most loving question. I want to know what life means to you. I want to know what this moment means to you. And then when they tell you, you just say thank you. You know? Okay? So that's the deal. Take about 10 minutes. Find two other people. Rearrange these chairs. Organize that sergeant. So I want to treat this whole time as a protocol set of social structures. Because they all tie together. So you start with context. For some reason that we came here, you have to let people know what you have in mind. And if they say, that's not what I came for, then I say, thank you. I won't be deflected. Because you you're in a room with people, and you have a contract with something larger you can't get in because it's not good. Sometimes I, people say, I didn't come here to break in small groups. <laughs> I didn't come to touchy feely stuff. And I say, I, I know you didn't come for that. Thank you. And then you look away. <laughs> Balanced reporting is not telling what the two crazy sides are saying. That's what's wrong with journalism. Balanced reporting is you got an idiot over here and an idiot over here. And I tell you, I'm not interested in what the extremes have to say. So I don't want to give them power in the room. I don't want to pay attention to them. I don't want to argue with anything. This is the dumbest stuff I've ever heard. I say, good point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to encourage them. I can say that. It's some of the dumbest stuff I've ever said. So together. <laughs> but you don't want to give power. That's why the small groups takes power. If you put people on a microphone in the middle of the room in a hearing or something, you give them power to the idiots. And I, I, I know if there's extremists, fundamentalists in the room. I don't... I'd rather sacrifice two small groups with them than let them control the whole group. So all these structures have a political or relational intent to affect the small group, people know the least. Um, now, when we come back together, you never ask people to report on what happened. Reports are boring. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they're reporting on something that never occurred. <laughs> chance to speak, screw you. Here's what I wanted to talk about. I mask it as a report, so I don't ask you. Okay. So what I do, I'm interested in is what struck you. So you're trying to bring reflection. So in Pharaoh's Egypt, the purpose of the Sabbath was to have one day a week without restless productivity. So no matter how much the Jews made, or whatever story you have, it wasn't enough. So six days a week, whatever you do is not enough. This is the management notion. Mm -hmm. Arguing that you know, the sports analogies and stating standards and all this kind of controlling. So all those things extract our humanity. So what you're trying to restore really is our capacity to be human with each other. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy, professionalism, certification, all extracts humanity. And so, we, so I ask people what struck you, which means that I'm asking everybody to reflect on their own experience. And I'm inviting lightning into the room. I want to be hit by light. I'm waiting to be hit by light. Especially for my favorite group, the middle-aged white male. They're <laughs> <laughs> such lousy learners. And God tries to whisper it to us, and eventually he gives us a heart attack. <laughs> Divorce, you know, and then light. And a friend of mine had a heart attack, at least from Coca-Cola years ago, in the doctor's office, and it saved his life. He said, "Wow, this is significant." You got to reflect on this. And we, what he did is he went out and bought a BMW. <laughs> this is how the male mind works. Now I'm free. I have a big ass four-door. <laughs> and he carries a little, he was so precious.
attaches to them, he'd carry things in his trunk with magnets and pads so nobody would scratch this BMW. Wow. So this creates the question, what struck you? Chance for lightning. And it gives you a chance to think, so what did I experience with these two or three other people in the last 15 years? So it's a Sabbath moment. Except that the world needs time for reflection. So let me ask you to share. Now, when you ask the week to share, all you need is four people to speak. Once four people have spoken, you've heard the room. Otherwise, anything can get blowing and everybody feels they have to speak. As a facilitator, you have to go around the damn room. All right? And if you go around the room, don't ever go around by geographic. <laughs> you start next, we'll just go around left to right, right to left. It's stealing choice. So these are all little ways you're asking for freedom. So let me ask you what struck you about the conversation. Just <coughs> yeah, right. Gratitude. Just stand up. Oh, I have your name? Gratitude for Father. Yeah, gratitude for the work that these women are doing and that everyone in the room is doing yeah. and has done. And who they are. And who yeah. they are. Yeah. Stand up and give us your name. Miguel, uh, I felt like I was struck by lightning. And, and part of what I was speaking, I used the word helping others. And I didn't even realize that I used that. And one of my companions pointed it out and was like, oh my God, it's part of my discourse. I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so even the detail, somebody about you ask for people to choose to speak, which takes courage, especially the first time. Uh, he has to stand for something. So I want to create a world where we're all standing, finding our own life. And then you ask them the name. <coughs> all the stupid little things. They don't mean anything. But when you thread them together, it's constructing a different way. So it's a collection. The angels are in the detail. Only the patriarchs. The details are the feminine side of this. The feminine understand the nuances of experience. An artist understands the nuance of everything, everyday thing. And so all of these kind of being an alternative to the patriarch. Forget about men and women. But you also like to share what struck you. Conversation. Yes. Stand up. Um, What's your name? Tabby. So I um, reflecting on what struck me and what struck me with both of my companions is openness because they all are places in their lives where they didn't expect to be, but because of being open, new opportunities came to them. Thank you. Thank you for saying something. So next question. Got it? Three, four people. In my mind, every room is its own organism. It's a body. You want to build a community of one room at a time. Which room is that the room I'm in? Too slow. I don't know how to be in two rooms at the same time. So part of the language that steals our humanity is the notion of scale. See, guys like scale. I don't want to go into it. <laughs> so anybody says, how do we take this to scale? And I know they don't want to see anything change. They want to take something that worked here, probably authentically. And as soon as you say, OK, let's transport this. This is a good pilot that could take the life out. Because then people are going to be doing things they have no voice in creating. Now it's good for the training business. All right, so take it to scale. How can we do it more quickly? Three. All right, what we're doing here is depth as an alternative to speed, intimacy as an alternative to scale. And so our group has its own being, its own life. You hear from four people, you discover and create space in the room. So. And then when I hear other people talk, I realize, I got that. I got that. Next question is a possibility question. And uh, the question is, what's the crossroads you're at at this stage of your life? So you can't start with this question because it's terrible. <laughs> but now that, now that we know each other and you're aware of this, you say, what's the crossroads you're at at this stage? Now, some people may not be at a crossroads. And then if you're not, you thank God for this too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> Crossroads means that life is choiceful. It's not a, it's a steady track to the North Star. 
I mean, it's life's complicated. It's an answer to Disney. So Disney says life is going to end up happily. But a crossroads say, to be human is to have two thoughts. For every great idea, the opposite idea is also true. And so it honors the complexity of who we are. So I'd like you to share with the other two people what's the crossroads you're at at this stage of your life. Now the instinct is, I don't know whether to stay or leave. Nah. <laughs> um, the response to that is, there's no place to go. <laughs> Whatever your story is about this place, that story is waiting for you in another location. <laughs> Maybe you can a little more, a little place you like better. And so that's the opening. So do I stay or go? And then you say, tell me more. And so the crossroads, and we've had a question of the crossroads of the other two people. It's why is it an attitude? Now what are you going to do with them? Not to give them any advice. And when they tell you why it matters, ask them, well, why does that matter to you? And you keep asking them why it matters until they get mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> take another 15 minutes. <laughs> So let me ask you again, so I've given you two questions. One is, why was it important for you to be here today, which helped people be present and realize it means something. If I can figure out what today means for me, I can figure out what my life means. Uh, and it introduces meaning as something worth talking about instead of just productivity. And the second question is, what's the crossroads you're at? treats you as choiceful, as conscious. Now, having done that, 15 minutes, let me ask you what struck you about that kind of stuff. Now, if you let the small groups go on too long, they get tribal. <laughs> Everybody thinks that we have the best small group in the room. Screw <laughs> the rest of the community. And that's the dark side of neighborhood. <laughs> so I think, oh, wait, I, yeah, we're a great community, great neighborhood. I know four people and we're really close. So. <laughs> These are all our children. This whole block. I know that public safety is related to eyes and hearts and feet on the sidewalks. Front porch is all that. So let me ask you, though, what struck you about this conversation? Yes, thank you. Stand up and give us your name. Uh, I'm Nancy Riesenberg. What struck me about this conversation was that um, I'm a very literal person, so when you said if you told your story three times, you're, you know, you're not really kind of telling the truth. And so the first time around, I didn't have much that I could say because I felt as though I was always wanting to tell one of my stories. You. But this story, this question about Crossroads was um, uh, more uh, specific and engaging and um, even though we didn't get all the way around, and I'm not saying that we're tribal, but we are a really nice group. <laughs> <laughs> the best group. <laughs> it was apparent that that is, uh, um, I, I can't imagine that there's a time in your life when you don't feel that there's some kind of crossroad. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that people ever get the chance to stop and think about that. And, and so that was, uh, that was a gift. And it doesn't matter if you get around. Because we're telling each other stories. And our crossroads are so intertwined. And, uh, and you can always catch up. That's a beautiful story. See, the question itself is how. What's the crossroads? Because if you're not at a crossroads, then you're not alive. You're living a life you haven't chosen. As the world's too whacked out now to be a bit. Certainty is the business perspective. Blueprint, managing change, we have all this silly little guy language. How are we going to manage change? It's good that if you don't know where you're going, I like the fact that I don't know where I'm going. So that means any road will get you there. <laughs> <laughs> business perspective. Goals, 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 and research. I know the Rand Corporation. Did you hear from the Rand Corporation? Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep moving on. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Who did you hear? 
<laughs> see, the eva in evaluating kind of social focused things, you've got to be careful that you don't use the business perspective to evaluate cost, efficiency, speed, scale. It almost you need to, the qualitative, you need to somehow capture. Uh, your question is, are you, in what ways are you touching people's lives? And that's a complicated answer, but it's a complicated question. I saw one study, and it wasn't the man who did a Palo Alto, Hewlett Packard Foundation. Put a lot of money in East Palo Alto. And then they researched it. And uh, they, what they saw was that people weren't connected. There was no social capital. So another way to describe what you're up to in the world is building social capital. But then the recommendations from the researcher was they needed more planning. Okay, and so the business perspective thinks no matter what the problem is, more planning is needed, more predictability is needed. But what needed was more relationship to it, more connection. So that's the, anybody else? Yes. Josh. Josh Wachtel. I was just struck by how uh, the question and the answers really got right past professional orientation and uh, the intersection between personal and professional. Yes, I'm Lynn. And I must be the maverick here because what struck me was actually the missing voice um, we, that we didn't get around and that I feel that this woman here has a voice and I wanted to hear her story. So for me, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And she's got a story. The nice thing about the, what struck you as a, as a guider, whatever you are, you don't have to be invested in people's answers. Some people will be very disappointed about what just happened. And you say thank you. So that you don't have, that's why you don't need to facilitate a small group, and you don't have to be invested. As a leader, you don't have to have an answer for questions people come to. As a leader, I'm not here to meet your expectations. And you know why? Because people's expectations are too low. 